Continuing with our Bible study, a walk through the book of Acts. Tonight we're up to chapter 21. And we are at this point, we're at Paul's third missionary journey. This is his final missionary journey. And uh, <clears throat> tonight, <clears throat> excuse me, we're looking at his return. So his journey started in Antioch. He went all the way up through Asia. He came up through Macedonia, Thessalonica, uh, Berea, all the way down uh, to Corinth. Now he's going backwards. He's more or less retracing his steps, at least until he gets to Troas. And then he kind of breaks off a little bit. Uh, he's wanting to head back to Jerusalem, as you might recall. And the Spirit of the Lord has spoken through a number of sources uh, prophetically to him that he is facing a very difficult time in Jerusalem. And he's told the elders at Ephesus, I will not see you anymore. And he's charged them with a wonderful charge that we looked at last week. And uh, so this is the continuation of his return trip, his journey from Miletus to Jerusalem, verses 1 through 16, Acts chapter 21. And it came to pass that after we were gotten from them and had launched, we came with a straight course unto Coos, and the day following unto Rhodes, and from thence to Patara, and finding a ship sailing over unto Phoenicia, we went aboard and set forth. Now when we had discovered Cyprus, we left it on the left hand and sailed into Syria and landed at Tyre, for there the ship was to unlaid her burden. And finding disciples, we tarried there seven days, who said to Paul through the Spirit that he should not go up to Jerusalem. And when we had accomplished those days, we departed and went our way, and they all brought us on our way with wives and children, till we were out of the city, and we kneeled down on the shore and prayed. And when we had taken our leave one of another, we took ship, and they returned home again. And when we had finished our course from Tyre, we came to Ptolemius and saluted the brethren and abode with them one day. And the next day we were of uh, we that were of Paul's company departed and came unto Caesarea, and we entered into the house of Philip the Evangelist, which was one of the seven, and abode with him. And the same man had four daughters, virgins, which did prophesy. And as we tarried there many days, there came down from Judea a certain prophet named Agabus. And when he was come unto us, he took Paul's girdle and bound his own hands and feet and said, Thus saith the Holy Ghost, So shall the Jews at Jerusalem bind the man that owneth this girdle, and shall deliver him into the hands of the Gentiles. And when we heard these things, both we and they of that place besought him, meaning Paul, not to go up to Jerusalem. Then Paul answered, What mean ye to weep and to break mine heart? For I am ready not to be bound only, but also to die at Jerusalem for the name of the Lord Jesus. And when he would not be persuaded, we ceased, saying, The will of the Lord be done. And after those days we took up our carriages and went up to Jerusalem, there went with us also certain of the disciples of Sisera, and brought with them one uh, Nason of Cyprus, an old disciple, with whom we should lodge. Now, all that to say this. While they're traveling back, you'll notice that the Spirit of the Lord is speaking prophetically to Paul. Over and over again. Now here's something most churches aren't going to tell you. Most preachers aren't going to tell you. But it's the word of God. Look at what the Spirit of the Lord told Paul to do. The Spirit of the Lord said, do not go to Jerusalem. Hello now. I, I don't know about you, but I read where it says, uh, thus saith the Holy Ghost. Here in verse 11. 
Thus saith the Holy Ghost, so shall the Jews of Jerusalem bind the man that owned this girdle and shall deliver it in the hands of the Gentiles. And you'll notice that up here earlier, it also told us that, uh, let me see, where is it? Verse 4. Verse 4. And finding disciples, we tarried there seven days, who sent to Paul through the Spirit that he should not go up to Jerusalem. Over and over and over again, the Holy Ghost is telling Paul, do not go to Jerusalem. But Paul has a martyr mindset. I'm ready to be offered, oh, I'm ready to die for Jesus' name. I don't care if you're ready to die or not, your work may not be done. Here's an example, folks. Again, I'm telling you, most pastors aren't going to tell you this. Most churches aren't going to tell you. Here is an example of someone letting their flesh overrule the leading of the Spirit. God does not speak prophetically so he can hear his own voice. Right. The Lord was trying to tell Paul over and over again, do not go to Jerusalem. Don't go right now. Don't go right now. But Paul had in his, I'm going to tell you, there are people in the church world today, it don't matter what God says, they got something in their head, and you ain't going to shake it out of them. And they're going to do what they're going to do. There are people that are sick, that won't be healed, because the Lord can tell them over and over and over again, He wants to heal them, but if they've got it in their head that God don't want to heal them for this reason or that reason, then by God, they're not going to be healed. Don't matter what the Lord says. My Lord, have mercy. Are you hearing me tonight? You see, we've got to be careful to understand how and why the Spirit works the way the Spirit works. When God speaks to us prophetically, we are to do what the Spirit of the Lord tells us to do. Paul does not do that. What we're going to go into in the next two chapters and see some of the things Paul goes through, he did not have to go through these things. But you're going to see an example of how the Lord sometimes can work through our stubbornness and our stupidity. And He ultimately can bring good out of a bad situation. But it's important that you understand this dynamic here. It's important that you understand tonight that it was not the will of God that Paul do what Paul went on to do. Sometimes we put ourselves through a lot of foolishness that we don't have to put ourselves through if we would just listen to the Lord to begin with. Uh -huh. Amen. Right. All right. So that is what we're, I want you to understand that as we start looking at Paul's return to Jerusalem. We, we read last week mm -hmm. that he was being warned not to go. Mm -hmm. Over and over again, everywhere he went, it says that prophetically he was being warned not to go. Well, honey, why in the world? The Word of God said, out of the mouth of two or three witnesses shall every word be established. Once you've had two or three people tell you, that means God has confirmed it. Mm -hmm. So you don't do it. But Paul insists he's got to go back to Jerusalem. He's ready. Honestly, he may have been tired. He may have been wore out from the fight. He may have been wore out from the Jews uh, ripping him every time he, you know, he went into a new city. He might have been flat out wore out and ready to give up the ghost and just say, Lord, take me home. I got news for you. This preacher's been there. Mm -hmm. There are times I've gotten so tired in the last 19 years that I've literally welcomed the notion of, Lord, if I get sick and die, oh well. You know, because I'm tired. I'm tired of this battle. I'm tired of this war. And sometimes that mindset can lead you to do the wrong things and to disobey the leading of the Holy Ghost. Mm -hmm. My Lord have mercy. I believe more people in the faith die when they're sick. And struggling with illness and disease. My God is a healer. He wants to heal. He desires to heal. 
But I believe more people die because the people simply get tired and they quit believing. It, they get to the point where it's, huh, I don't want to believe God for a miracle. I don't want to believe it. I'd rather just, I'd rather just go home at this point. Again, been there, done that. And if it were not for the Lord reminding me at the last second, I mean literally, as, as I felt personally, felt my spirit separating from my body. Literally. Mm -hmm. And then all of a sudden the thought came in my head, Harry, Michael, Bruno, the guys in our church that I was pastoring up in Connecticut. All of a sudden I thought of these guys and the thought went through my head, now they'll have no pastor. Because, folks, there's nobody waiting in the wings right now to pastor this church if I leave. If you think there's somebody just dying to pastor this church, if I were to leave Dallas, there ain't. We've got people all over the country wish to God there were churches like ours in their neighborhood, and they don't have them. We've got one here, but i got news for you. The reason they don't have one where they're at is because there is a real lack of Leadership. There's a real lack of ministry. There's not a lot of preachers out there in our community doing what I'm doing. And when the Lord reminded me of the burden that I carried for those men, all of a sudden I changed my mind and realized that whether I wanted to or not, I needed to stay. And literally I said, no, oh Lord, wait a minute, wait a minute. I need to stay. It's not that I wanted to because I didn't. But I knew for their sake I had to stay. And then boom. And if you've never felt it, uh, you will one day. But when your soul and your body begin to separate, and there is such a care, I can't even explain it. There is such a carefree, mm -hmm. you don't feel the cares of this world. You don't feel anxiety. You don't feel fear. You don't feel nothing negative, honey, all that is part of your human existence. Yes. Emotions are part of your human existence. I, I didn't feel any of that at an emotional level. When the Lord allowed me it, during that just seconds to remember the, the men that I was responsible for here who would have no pastor if I were to leave, it was just a sense of duty that I felt. That's the only thing that, that made me realize, well, wait a minute, I have a duty to these people. But I didn't, I didn't, you know, I, I, I didn't even know how to explain it. And then when, when I felt like God just reunited my spirit and my, my body, it literally was with a thud. You don't realize how heavy your human existence is. You don't realize Honey, when God sets you free, you know, like the old song says, Once like a bird in prison I dwelt, no freedom from my sorrow I felt. But Jesus came, and listen to me, glory to God, he set me free. I'm going to tell you, when, when the Lord sets you free from this body and from this life, it is the most wonderful, light, carefree freedom you've ever experienced in all of your days. And to be place back into it <laughs> is almost like having a chain tied around your neck with a great big old hook on the end of it, an anchor, you know, and boom! Literally, you realize how heavy just human existence is. So for whatever reason, Paul is tired. He's wore out. He probably just sick and tired of fighting people. I know this preacher gets sick and tired of fighting people. Especially young people. And he was wore out and tired. And he's probably got something of a, a suicidal mindset, as it were. Well, bless God. I know the Lord keeps saying I shouldn't go to Jerusalem, but by God, I'm going to go anyway. I remember, I'll give you an example. I, didn't, I wouldn't plan on going into all this for this portion, but I will. Uh, when I was dating... The girl I married years ago, before I proposed marriage to her, before I lost my mind and got crazy. <laughs> uh, I was going to go up, I was scheduled to go up and visit with Sister Bruce in her church up in uh, Shamrock, Texas. Sister Bruce had been asking me to come, asking me to come, asking me to come. 
and I was scheduled to go. And I had this overwhelming sense of reservation come over me. And I had this powerful sense that I really sh shouldn't go right now. And I told the girl I married, and I told uh, her mom, I said, I, I have this powerful feeling from the Holy Ghost that I just shouldn't go right now. Well, why? I said, the thing that keeps coming to me is that I'm going to have a real big confrontation with one of the members of her church. Now, I've been to that church many times. I've never had a problem with anybody in that church. Never. And I could not for the life of me understand how I would have a confrontation with somebody in that church. This is an example of where when God speaks to you prophetically and you try to interpret what He says instead of just doing what He says. So I ignored what I was feeling and I went to Shamrock anyway. Well, I got there on uh, day one and I'm trying to recall, I think, I think Sunday we had church because I got there on Saturday, stayed overnights. Sunday we had church, and the next day I'm driving through town, and I come up on a traffic light, and I go to step on my brake to stop my car because the light turned red, and I had no brakes. My car had lost its brakes. The brakes had been getting bad for a while, and I knew they were, but unfortunately I didn't have the money right then to fix them. I went careening through this intersection, and I mean, I was going a good 40, 45 miles an hour at least. And I hit the back end of a car that was coming the other way. You know, crossways like this. Hit the back end of his car. I spun his car completely around 360 degrees. That's how fast I was going. And my car turned so that I was facing the same direction he was facing. So I hit him, his car spun around one full time, continuing to go in this direction, and my car turned like this. The back of my seat broke, and my, I went backwards on the seat, and I was laying there looking up at the ceiling. This is before airbags, and before seat belts were required by law. And the back of my seat broke, and I'm laying there, Jack, looking up at the ceiling. My car was totaled. The whole front end was completely demolished. Guess who I hit? Members of Sister Bruce's church. I had a confrontation with men. Now, it wasn't what I thought it was going to be. I was interpreting the concept of confrontation one way. God meant it something very different, but it was still a confrontation. Mm. You follow? Yeah. And so anyhow, uh, if I had obeyed the Lord, and if I had done what I felt the Lord leading me to do, I'd have put off that trip right then. Right. Probably until I got my brakes fixed. Mm -hmm. But instead, you know, I didn't do that. Well, brother and sister Bruce got all upset with me and were all mad at me because they thought I was... I was just a kid, you got to remember, I was about 20, and they thought I was all, you know, daydreaming about Stacy and, you know, wasn't paying any attention and all that. And it wasn't until about a month later or so, and I was back in Fort Worth, that Brother Bruce called me on the phone and said, Chuck, since your car's totaled and it's here in my yard, because he was a mechanic, he said, uh, would you mind, he said, the folks, I can't remember if it was the folks I hit or somebody else in the church needed tires. And the tires I had on my car were brand new. I had just put them on very recently. He said, would you mind if I took those tires off and let them have them? I said, no, by all means, go ahead. Well, he did, and he called me back, and he said, Chuck, uh, I want to apologize to you, son. And he was almost in tears. Because, I'm serious, brother and sister Bruce were kind of like adopted mom and dad to me. And uh, that meant when they wanted to tear me a new one, they did. And they thought I was all daydreaming about Stacy and wasn't paying attention, and that's why I had this accident. Well, Brother Bruce called me back, and he was almost in tears. He said, son, I'm so sorry. I am so sorry. He said, we 
chewed you up, spit you out over that accident. He said, I took those tires off today. He said, you had no brakes. He said, once I took the tires off, I could see you didn't have any braking power whatsoever. Now I see why you went through that intersection. Now I see why what happened happened. Okay? My whole point being this. I had a warning from the Holy Ghost. But I did what I wanted to do anyhow. All right? Paul is doing this. Now, let's move on. Verses 17 through 26, Paul tries to appease the hostile Jews. Verse 17, and when we were come to Jerusalem, all right, now he's back in Jerusalem where he is so bent on being. The brethren received us gladly, and the day following Paul went in with us unto James, and all the elders were present. And when he had saluted them, he declared particularly what things God had brought among the Gentiles by his ministry. And when they had heard it, they glorified the Lord and said unto him, Thou seest, brother, how many thousands of Jews there are which believe, and they are all zealous of the law. And they are informed of thee that thou teachest all the Jews which are among the Gentiles to forsake Moses, saying that they ought not to circumcise their children, neither to walk after the customs. What is it therefore? The multitude must needs come together, for they will hear that thou art come. Do therefore this that we say to thee. We have four men which have a vow on them. Take them and purify thyself with them, and be at charges with them, that they may shave their heads, and all may know that those things whereof they were informed concerning thee are nothing, but that thou thyself also walkest orderly and keepest the law. As touching the Gentiles which believe, we have written and concluded that they observe no such thing, save only that they keep themselves from things offered to idols, and from blood, and from strangled, and from fornication. Then Paul took them in, and the next day, purifying himself with them, entered into the temple to signify the accomplishment of the days of purification, until that an offering should be offered for every one of them. Okay, Paul gets back to Jerusalem, and the first thing he shares with the, the Jews in Jerusalem, the Jewish church, uh, all about everything God's doing amongst the Gentiles. And they're thrilled. They rejoice with him. Uh, I, as I was reading and preparing for this Bible study tonight, I, I read this, Jack, and, and it talked about how Paul declared to them everything that was going on with the Gentiles and how they rejoiced. And it reminded me of me going down to a conference one of the first conferences that I ever attended when I first found out there were other affirming Pentecostals in the universe because I didn't know there were. And I went to this conference down in Indiana and I arrived and there's a household full, a house full of preachers, affirming preachers. And I've told you the story before. And I was so thrilled to find fellowship. I was so thrilled to find other preachers, you know, in our movement. And I began to tell them all about what the Lord was doing in New York and what we were doing in New York and all. And they stood there looking at the wall like, oh, Jesus, is this guy going to keep talking? When is he going to shut up? And it wasn't a few of them. It was all of them. And I felt so stupid. I never felt so out of place. And I never felt so foolish, Jack, in my entire life. Mm -hmm. I literally felt foolish because it was so obvious. These people couldn't have cared less about one word I was saying. That should have told me right then and there something was wrong. Should have gotten on the bus and headed right on back to New York is what I should have done. Yeah. Because when somebody shares with you what they're trying to do and what the Lord's been doing. And I, we had baptized dozens of people in New York City in Jesus' name. Honey, we should have been shouting. We should have been having church. We should have been rejoicing. We, they should have been glad to hear the news. 
Instead of looking at the walls like, oh, Lord Almighty, what's this guy, what's, what's he talking about? Wait a it should have been a time of rejoicing. And uh, I know when somebody comes to me and they're excited about the work they're doing and the Lord's doing things, that my response is, well, hallelujah, praise the Lord, that's great, that's wonderful. People contact me all the time and tell me, we're trying to start a work up here in Kentucky. We're trying to start a work up here in this place or that place. And I write them back and say, that's wonderful. If there's anything we can do to help you, if there's any way we can support you and help you in what you're trying to do, by all means, let me know. So the church was excited, as they ought to have been, mm -hmm. for what the Lord was doing in the Gentile world. However, because they were in, they were in the headquarters, as it were, of Judaism, Jerusalem, <laughs> because they were right in the heart of the Jewish faith, Jerusalem, they said, Paul, there's only one problem. A lot of the Jews in our city and in, in Judea, the Jewish world, are believers now, but they're still holding to the law. They're still keeping the law. And they've heard that you're teaching the Gentiles that they ought not to keep the law, that they're not responsible for keeping the Jewish law. So they made a suggestion. Now you'll notice that Paul comes to the house of James. Mm -hmm. You remember back earlier when the controversy arose about how the church should respond to the Gentiles concerning the law? How it was James mm -hmm. who came up with the conclusion and said, here are the four things that we need to tell them. Abstain from things strangled, which is anything related to idols. Uh, abstain from uh, blood, abstain from fornication, you know. And it was James who come up with this, and the church adopted what James had suggested. So Paul was going on the authority of the church of Jerusalem, and he was preaching these things in the Gentile world. Well, they were not reneging on what they had determined. The apostles and the church of Jerusalem, they were not turning their back on what they had said. Not by a million miles. But what they did do is they said, here's wisdom. Sometimes, folks, there are things you need to do out of sheer wisdom. I was talking to Gabriel the other day about there's some things sometimes you need to do out of wisdom. And it, it may not be the thing you want to do. It may not make you the happiest camper in the, in the camp. But it's wisdom. And so the church is saying, the men are saying to Paul, here's what you need to do. Go through the purification process. Why would Paul have to go through purification? Why would he have to go through the ritual of purification, including the act of shaving his head? Because he's been among the Gentiles. So according to the Jewish faith, he has in fact dirtied himself. He's made himself unclean. So he has to go through, he and the men that are with him, they have to go through this ritual of purification. Right down to shaving their heads. Why would you shave your head? Start, among other things, it was the start of a um, Nazarite vow. Well, it is, but that he wasn't doing a Nazarite vow. Right. But it's, it's an act that is symbolic of doing away with anything that is unclean. What do you get in your hair? that you have to shave your head to get rid of. Lice. Mm -hmm. So basically, if you're going to hang out with the Gentiles, you come back, and as far as God's concerned, according to the Old mm -hmm. Testament, you've got lice. Do you follow what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. So they have this ritual that includes the shaving your head, which is symbolic of discarding the lice, getting rid of any opportunity for anything that traveled in with you to stay with you. Okay, so they tell him, this is what you need to do, and then what this will do is this will put you back in good graces with the Jewish believers here in Jerusalem. Even though, and you'll notice, verse 25 and down is touching the Gentiles which believe, we have written and concluded. So they're not reneging 
on what they told him. They're not reneging on, on the instruction they gave for the Gentiles. They're asking him to do this for no other reason but to put himself kind of in good graces with the believing Jews. Well, isn't that funny, Tommy? Some folks tell us that the Christian church shouldn't have any kind of separations, shouldn't be any kind of schisms. Everybody should believe identically the same way. Because after all, that's how the early church did. Baloney. Mm -hmm. That's right. Baloney. You had major differences of opinion in the early church. Major, enormous, whopper differences of opinion. And here Paul is doing the right thing. He's preaching the right message to the Gentiles. Yet, when it comes back to Jerusalem, because of the beliefs and the convictions of the Jews of Jerusalem, he has to approach things a very different way. It's like people, I've, I've spoken to people over the years who talk about Abraham Lincoln. And they quote certain things that Abraham Lincoln said in his life that made it sound as though he wasn't as pro uh, doing away with slavery as, as history says he was. I've had people of color uh, just get into big debates with me about Abraham Lincoln and I said, can I tell you a little secret? Can I tell you? Let me, let me help you understand the real world for a minute. When you have a clear conviction on a certain issue like slavery, Abraham Lincoln did not believe in slavery. He abhorred slavery. I've got a quote right here that I keep right here. One of my favorite Abraham Lincoln quotes. He said, I know there is a God and that he hates injustice and slavery. I am nothing, but truth is everything. I know I am right because I know that liberty is right. For Christ teaches it, and Christ is God. <laughs> That's Abraham Lincoln said that. But because he said other things while he was running for office, people try to suggest, oh, he only freed the slaves out of sheer necessity. No, 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 no. Let me help you understand something. And, and how you can't understand this, I'll never know. Sometimes politicians have to say what they got to say to get elected. Because they can't do anything for anybody until they're elected. So sometimes they sound like they're a little more chummy with the enemy than they really are. You following my line of thought? Because they're trying to get elected. Once they get elected, then they can do what they their conscience dictates. Then they can do what they can. But if he got up running for president and said, I'm going to abolish slavery the minute I go into office. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Because that's the right thing to do. He'd have never gotten elected. So there are times when wisdom dictates. And Paul is in a position where he is going to be totally ineffectual in ministering to the Jewish community in Jerusalem if he does not do this. So he decides, okay, fine, we'll do this. We'll go through this, uh, we'll go through this ritual of purification, and then hopefully that'll put us back in good graces with the Jewish church. Now, Paul's arrested in Jerusalem, verses 27 through 30. And when the seven days were almost ended, the Jews, which were of Asia, when they saw him in the temple, stirred up the people and laid hands on him, crying out, Men of Israel, help! This is the man that teacheth all men everywhere against the people and the law and this place, meaning the temple, and further brought Greeks also into the temple and hath polluted this holy place. For they had seen before with him in the city 
Trophimus and Ephesian whom they supposed that Paul had brought into the temple. And all the city was moved and the people ran together and they took Paul and drew him out of the temple and forthwith the doors were shut. Paul got thrown out of the temple. Why? Remember what we've talked about throughout the entire book of Acts about this negative attitude that the Jews have about the Gentiles. Remember what I told you when we talked about the story of the Good Samaritan and I told you the Jews see this man wounded on the street and on the off chance he's a Gentile, I'd rather let him die than help him. Because there's such a negative attitude toward the Gentile world. And it is taken to such an ungodly, unholy extreme. And it is an ungodly, unholy extreme. Mm -hmm. But now, here are Jews who have come to the temple in Jerusalem, who are actually from Asia. So they've traveled a great distance, probably for Pentecost, because Paul was wanting to be at Jerusalem for Pentecost. They'd either come for the Passover and they were going to stay through Pentecost or they had come specifically for Pentecost. Whatever reason, these were men that had seen Paul in other cities during his missionary tour. And they're accusing him. He, he brings Gentiles into our synagogues. He brings Gentiles into the temple. By this man, he's guilty of the worst thing you could possibly do. He teaches people that they don't have to follow our customs. They don't have to do things the way we believe things ought to be done. And they throw them out of the temple. Now, the people riot as Paul is arrested, verses 31 through 40, and as they went about to kill him, tidings came unto the chief captain of the band and uh, that all Jerusalem was in an uproar who immediately took soldiers and centurions and ran down unto them. And when they saw the chief captain and the soldiers, they left beating of Paul. Then the chief captain came near and took him and commanded him to be bound with two chains and demanded who he was and what he had done. And some cried one thing, some another among the multitude. And when he could not know the certainty for the tumult, he commanded him to be carried into the castle. And when he came upon the stairs, so it was that he was born of the soldiers for the violence of the people. In other words, the people were so violent, they were trying so hard to beat the life out of Paul, that the soldiers had to pick him up, literally, and hold him up above the crowd. Or else they'd have beat him to death. They're trying to arrest the man. And these people are just rioting. They're going nuts. Any time you had this kind of a tumult going on, the Romans, of course, responded in quick order because this could easily turn into a uh, rebellion. Okay? They don't know what's going on. All they know is, boy, half the city of Jerusalem is going nuts right now. These Jewish folks are having a fit. So they step in, they try to figure out what's going on. They find out, well, Paul's at the center of this thing. So they grab and say, well, we're going to arrest him. That don't stop everybody. They keep going. They're still going to beat the guy to death. They have to pick him up. Lift him up over the crowd to try to get him out of the area. So they can get him to the jail. All right. Uh, for the multitude of the people followed after, crying, away with him. And as Paul was led into the castle, he said unto the chief captain, May I speak unto thee? Who said, Canst thou speak Greek? Are not thou that Egyptian which before these days madest an uproar and us out into the wilderness four thousand men that were murderers? See, this, this, this captain of the Roman guard, he, he thinks Paul's somebody entirely different. He cannot imagine that this tumult is going on for as simple a reason as it's actually happening. He said, aren't you this guy that not too long ago did this and took all these murder? In other words, somebody who was trying to plan a rebellion. Somebody who grabbed hold of as many violent men as he could get his hands on, led him out of town and was planning a revolt. He said, aren't you he? 
and Paul says, look, look how Paul answers. But Paul said, I am a man which am a Jew of Tarsus, a city in Cilicia, a citizen of no mean city, and I beseech thee, suffer me to speak unto the people. And when he had given him license, Paul stood on the stairs and beckoned with a hand unto the people. And when there was made a great silence, he spake unto them in the Hebrew tongue. So now see, he speaks to the captain of the guard in Greek, which is the language of the day. That's the language most commonly. However, the Jewish people to this day, to this day, their language is Hebrew. You're going to talk to Hebrews and you want to be taken seriously and you want them to hear you, you want them to listen, you better talk to them in Hebrew. So that's what Paul does. So he begins to address them in Hebrew, saying, now mind you, look at, look at here, saying, comma, <laughs> next chapter. <laughs> See what I mean about how the chapters and the verses divided up? You know, it, it's, it, it's not always in the most convenient place. Okay. That's why you got to be careful. There are a lot of people, folks, who build their doctrine on the way Scripture's divided up. You better be careful. You better be real careful. Okay, we go into the next chapter now, chapter 22. This is Paul's defense before the Jews. So this is just continuing from the last chapter now. This is what Paul says to the Jewish people in the Hebrew tongue. Men, brethren, and fathers, hear ye my defense which I make now unto you. And when they heard that he spake in the Hebrew tongue to them, they kept the more silence. And he saith, I am verily a man which am a Jew, born in Tarsus, a city of Cilicia, yet brought up in this city at the feet of Gamaliel, and taught according to the perfect manner of the law of the fathers, and was zealous toward God as ye all are this day. Paul said, I become all things to all men. He's identifying with them. He's saying, folks, I'm a Jew. I got one of the best Jewish educations anybody could get. Y'all know what a great teacher Gamaliel is. He said, I was taught the perfect way of the law. And I was every bit as zealous as you all are. And he's, he's kind of giving them credit, saying, y'all are zealous. He said, I was as zealous as you were, as you are. He said, and I persecuted this way. Unto the death. What way? The way of Christ. He said, I persecuted unto the death, binding and delivering into prisons both men and women, as also the high priest doth bear me witness, and all the estate of the elders, for whom also I received letters unto the brethren, and went to Damascus to bring them which were there bound unto Jerusalem, for to be punished. And as it came to pass that as I made my journey and was come nigh unto Damascus about noon, suddenly there shone from heaven a great light round about me. And I fell unto the ground and heard a voice saying unto me, Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? So now Saul, Paul, is sharing his testimony. He's sharing with them. This testimony is repeated over and over again. We read it three different times in the book of Acts. The same testimony, word for word. So here it is, noontime. The brightest time of the day, and yet a light shone even brighter than the noonday sun. And a voice was heard saying, Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? And I answered, Who art thou, Lord? And he said unto me, I am Jesus of Nazareth, whom thou persecutest. And they that were with me saw indeed the light and were afraid, but they heard not the voice of him that spoke to me. And I said, What shall I do, Lord? And the Lord said unto me, Mm -hmm. 
He's talking to a Hebrew audience. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And the Lord said unto me, I got news for you, honey. Every Hebrew in that audience is hearing, and God said unto me. That's right. Mm -hmm. That's right. Okay. Everybody in that, in that audience hears, and God said unto me, Arise and go into Damascus, and there it shall be told thee of all things which are appointed for thee to do. And when I could not see for the glory of that light, being led by the hand of them that were with me, I came into Damascus. And one Ananias, a devout man according to the law, he's identifying Ananias as a Jew, and a good one at that, having a good report of all the Jews which dwelt there, came unto me and stood and said unto me, Brother Saul, receive thy sight. And the same hour I looked upon him, and he said, The God of our fathers hath chosen thee, that thou shouldest know his will, and see that just one. Whew. Mm -hmm. And shouldest hear the voice of his mouth. For thou shalt be his witness unto all men of what thou hast seen and heard. And now why tarriest thou? Why do you wait? Arise and be baptized. And wash away thy sins. Calling on the name of the Lord. There are foolish people that try to tell me. That Jesus name baptism. Nowhere in the Bible is it said that, that Jesus name is used as the actual formula. As you're being baptized. Honey, that is a lie from the pit of hell. Three times this testimony is repeated. And every time, the way that it is worded makes it abundantly clear that during the course of the act of baptism, you call up a wee ton of us. Yes. Woo! Woo! You call on the name of the Lord. Uh -huh. Hallelujah. Mm. If there's ever a question as to what mode they use, what formula they use, then Paul's testimony answers that question. That's right. Uh -huh. That's right. My Lord have mercy. <laughs> and it came to pass that when I was come again to Jerusalem, even while I prayed in the temple, I was in a trance and saw him saying unto me, Who? Jesus. Make haste and get thee quickly out of Jerusalem, for they will not receive thy testimony concerning me. Who is the focus of the Christian message? Jesus. Jesus is not introducing us to the Father Jehovah. He, uh -huh. whoa, whoa, right. he is the focus. He is the center. He is at the middle and he is at the beginning. He is at the end. He said, they will not receive your testimony concerning me. And I said, Lord! <laughs> they know that I imprisoned and beat in every synagogue them that believed on thee. And when the blood of thy martyr Stephen was shed, I also was standing by and consenting unto his death and kept the raiment of them that slew him. And he said unto me, Depart, for I will send thee far hence unto the Gentiles. Hmm. So initially, the Lord told Paul, Get yourself out of Jerusalem. Mm -hmm. He was going to have problems in Jerusalem, no matter how you slice it. And again, to show you how stubborn Paul was, where did the Lord say he was going to send Paul? To the Gentiles. To the Gentiles. What did Paul try and try and try and try and try and try and try to do everywhere he went? Preach in the synagogues. <laughs> I'm telling you, the book of Acts shows you the humanity. It shows you the battle between the will of man and the will of God. It shows you the conflict between the flesh and the spirit. These people were as human, Josh, as you and I. There are foolish people, especially, I'm going to say it, especially in the Baptist world, who want to believe that every
everybody in the Bible was perfect. Everything they did was exactly what they were supposed to have done, the way they were supposed to have done it. That is not what the Scriptures tell us. The Jews in the Old Testament very seldom did what God wanted them to do the way God wanted them to do it. And the New Testament church was no different because you're still dealing with human beings full of the Holy Ghost, baptized in Jesus' name or not. They're still human. Well, that's a good point. Hallelujah. Amen. Let's shout a little while. Amen. Now, the minute he talks about the Gentiles, the hostility begins to boil. Verses 22 through 24. And they gave him audience unto his word, and then lifted up their voices and said, Away with such a fellow from the earth, for it is not fit that he should live. Oh, good grief. He mentions that God has told him that he's got to go preach to the Gentiles. And dear Lord Almighty, it's time to kill him. They've been quiet. They've listened right up until now. Mm -hmm. All of a sudden, they start screaming. And as they cried out and cast off their clothes and threw dust into the air, boy, I'll tell you what, talk about a bunch of drama queens. I thought our community had drama queens. <laughs> Looks like the Jewish community has ever been as many, if not a few more. The chief captain commanded him to be brought into the castle and bade that he should be examined by scourging, that he might know wherefore they cried so against him. So basically, the captain of the guard said, we need to torture this man with a whip for a while, find out why they're really mad at him. Because there's, there's got to be a reason you got to understand, listen carefully, he's been talking to these people in Hebrew. The guard don't understand what all he's been saying. All he sees is reaction. So he said, we got to punish this fellow. we got to beat this guy, we got to find out why in the world these people keep getting so crazy over him. Okay? Verses 25 through 30, Paul makes reference to his Roman citizenship, and as they bound him with thongs, Oh, Lord, I better fix that real quick for all the people in our community. We're not talking here about underwear, okay? As they bound him with thongs, Paul said unto the centurion that stood by. Now, of course, he's speaking Greek again. Is it lawful for you to scourge a man that is a Roman and uncondemned? When the centurion heard that, he went and told the chief captain, saying, Take heed what thou doest, for this man is a Roman. Then the chief captain came and said unto him, Tell me, art thou a Roman? He said, Yea. And the chief captain answered, With a great sum obtained I this freedom. Mm -hmm. See, this chief captain wasn't born part of the Roman Empire. He bought his freedom. He was, uh, he was a uh, subject to their colonization just like everybody else. But he was able to buy his freedom. He was taken as a slave. He was able to buy his freedom and then work his way up in the ranks of the Roman army. He said, I've been able to buy my freedom. And Paul said, but I was free born. <laughs> said, I got news for you, son. I was a Roman. The minute I was born, I was a Roman. Then straightway they departed from him, which should have examined him. And the chief captain also was afraid after he knew that he was a Roman and because he had bound him. Oh, all of a sudden the fact that Paul is technically a Roman, that he has Roman citizenship, this changes the whole story. This changes everything. On the morrow, because he would have known the certainty wherefore he was accused of the Jews, he loosed him from his bands and commanded the chief priests and all their council to appear and brought Paul down and set him before them. All right, so now the chief says, all right, we, we got to figure out what's going on here, but we're going to take them bands off this guy's hands. We're, we're going to treat him a little more lightly. There you go. <laughs> that was a whole 
thought there went, no, we hadn't finished the story. It's still going, but there's a division of chapters. Chapter 23, Paul's defense before the Sanhedrin. The Sanhedrin is the council of rabbis, the priests, that the captain is called for of the temple. Okay, this is the highest court in Judaism, as it were. Okay, the highest authority in Judaism. And Paul, earnestly beholding the council, said, Men and brethren, I have lived in all good conscience before God until this day. And the high priest Ananias commanded them that stood by him to smite him on the mouth. Then said Paul unto him, God shall smite thee, thou whited wall. For sittest thou to judge me after the law, and commandest me to be smitten contrary to the law? Isn't it funny how people that claim that they're Bible believers and they're going to, that they believe every word the Bible says, yet they don't think one second, Josh, about doing exactly the opposite of what the Bible tells them to do and how it tells them to do it. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah, they can hate the homosexual community because after all the Bible says, you know the Bible said they didn't got a right to hate anybody. You're supposed to love your enemies. Pray for them. Hello now. Oh, but they're so picky about what they, what they want to believe. They're so picky about what they're going to do and how they're going to do it. Mm -hmm. It's no different. Same thing. Paul's calling their bluff. He's calling their hypocrisy. He's like, oh, y'all standing here trying to judge me after the law. And yet, you do exactly what the law tells you not to do by commanding this man to smite me. And they that stood by said, Revilest thou God's high priest? How dare you speak against the high priest? Then said Paul, I wist not, brethren, that he was the high priest. For it is written, Thou shalt not speak evil of the ruler of thy people. Hmm. Oh, I could have a whole sermon here. <laughs> Touch not mine anointed, nor do my prophet any harm. You don't speak of God against God's anointed. That's right. Paul said, I wish this guy wasn't the high priest, because if he wasn't, boy, I'd tear into him like you wouldn't believe. But because he is, and because I respect the word of God, because I respect the scriptures, I won't. He said, but I wished he wasn't. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Is this the same Ananias that was yes. high priest when Christ Yes. Was yes. So now Paul, he said, the law prevents me from speaking evil against his anointed. The, Lord, the law prevents me from speaking evil against the ruler of God's people. You get people want to leave the church because they're ticked off at the preacher for something and then they want to run around the community talking bad about him and say, honey, you put yourself in a very bad place. I'm telling you right now, you have no idea what a bad place you put yourself in. I've left churches, and I mean, there was one church I went to as a kid, a teenager in Fort Worth, and the pastor had lost his mind, literally, and was doing things that you wouldn't even begin to believe, sleeping with several of the female members of his congregation, um, giving drugs to a young lady, cigarettes and everything to, to garner her sexual favors and blah, 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 blah. And when I left that church, I did not run around telling everybody in town about what I had seen and what happened. I told the proper authorities within the church it wasn't my business to publicize and, and talk about what this man had done and how he did it. No, that is not the way to conduct yourself. As a child of God, it, honey, you can call yourself saved all you want to. If you don't act saved, the Bible said you know them by their fruit. Mm -hmm. sure. If you don't act saved, you ain't saved, period. That's the end of the story. And if you're going to be a child of God, then you're going to act like a child of God. And and I, I didn't revel, I didn't rejoice, I didn't, you know, take joy in... in this man's failings. I didn't take joy. No, I was broken hearted at, at where he was at and what he was doing and, and what was going on. I was sick over it. 
And yet I know so-called Christian people, brother, you let them learn about somebody's sin or let them learn about somebody's weakness or, you know, their feeling, and boy, that becomes fodder for the fire and they're out there gossiping everywhere about it. That is not the way to conduct yourself, especially when it comes to men and women that are called of God and anointed of God. Well, if they're not acting like they ought to, it don't matter if they're acting like they ought to or not. David would not raise his finger against Saul, and Saul was not acting like he ought to. But he was still God's anointed. Mm -hmm. sure. You better watch your P's and Q's. Whether that man was acting right or not, at one time he had a call in his life. And he'll answer to God for everything he did. And he'll answer at a higher level than anybody in this room will answer because he had a call on his life mm -hmm. to lead God's people. But it is not my job to bad talk him and bad mouth him. But look at this. Here's, here's how the Spirit of the Lord gives you wisdom. Here's how the Spirit of the Lord will help you to know sometime how to answer. Jesus said, don't worry about what you're going to say ahead of time. He said, in that hour, the Spirit will tell you what to say. The Holy Ghost within you will tell you what you need to say. The Word of God said, but when Paul, verse 6, perceived that one part were Sadducees and the other Pharisees, he cried out in the council, Men and brethren, I am a Pharisee, the son of a Pharisee, oh boy, of the hope and resurrection of the dead, I am called in question. So the Holy Ghost speaks to Paul and says, Paul, here's a little something you might want to bear in mind. About half these fellows are Pharisees, about half these fellows are Sadducees. Hmm, interesting. There's some information I can use. So Paul proceeds to identify himself as a Pharisee. He says, I'm a Pharisee. Not only am I a Pharisee, I'm the son of a Pharisee. I'm a second generation Pharisee. Oh, Lord. All the Pharisees suddenly, huh, what's that? And it's because I preach the resurrection of the dead, because I preach Jesus come out of the tomb, that I'm called into question. What, what's that? Uh, did, did he say the only reason he's here now is because of the issue of the resurrection? Well, we believe in the resurrection. The guy's on the other side of the aisle, but we don't. Yeah, booby. Those that try to tell you that the Jewish faith was all perfectly uniform and everybody believed the same exact thing and they all had, and that's the way the New Testament church ought to be. They're full of nonsense. The Jewish faith was divided throughout all of history. There were all kinds of schisms within the body. There were all kinds of divisions. There were all kinds of differences of opinion. That's why some people followed this uh, uh, rabbi and others followed that rabbi because the teachings between them varied immensely I'm not bringing that up because there might be some Jehovah watching might be some Mormon watching and they foolishly have been made to believe that according to their organization you know their organization makes them act like a robot and everybody has to act and walk and live and talk exactly the same way and if you act even the slightest bit different you're going to be reprimanded and punished because after all everybody in quote the Christian church should believe and act and be identical wrong wrong Never has been that way, going all the way back to antiquity. Never will be that way. Why? Because God's church is comprised of who? Human beings. That's right. And that humanity issue will always be part of the factor. Always. <sighs> and when he had said so, so said, there arose a dissension <laughs> between the Pharisees and the Sadducees. And the multitude was divided. For the Sadducees say that there is no resurrection, neither angel nor spirit. But the Pharisees confess both. That is a huge difference. This is not a little tiny schism. This is not a little tenency difference of opinion. This changes your doctrine from head to toe. This changes everything. 
If you don't believe there's a resurrection, think about it. That's like folks that want to believe that God's going to come down and destroy those that don't believe and they're going to just disappear and no longer exist on the face of planet earth and have no existence in eternity. And those that preach there's a hell and you'll exist in hell throughout eternity. There's a world of difference between the two. Well, there's a world of difference between the way the Pharisees believe and the way the Sadducees believe. And yet they both worshiped in the same temple. Sure, they had common ground. Sure, they had, you know, they both, they both preached out of the same book. <laughs> but they both saw it very differently. They interpreted things very differently. And there arose a great cry, and the scribes that were of the Pharisees part arose and strove, saying, We find no evil in this man. <laughs> so the Pharisees, their people get up to, We don't find any problem with this man. Listen, he said, but if a spirit or an angel hath spoken to him, let us not fight against God. So they believe that angels exist and that God can communicate with his people through angels. They believe that spirits exist, okay? And when there arose a great dissension, the chief captain, fearing lest Paul should have been pulled in pieces of them, commanded the soldiers to go down and to take him by force from among them and to bring him into the castle. Pretty self-explanatory. The Lord appears to Paul. Thank God when we're in trouble. Jesus said, leave us alone. And the night following, the Lord stood by him. Thank you, Lord, for standing by me. Hallelujah to God. And said, be of good cheer, Paul. For as thou hast testified of me in Jerusalem, so must thou bear witness also at Rome. The Holy Ghost warned Paul, don't go to Jerusalem, don't go to Jerusalem, don't go to Jerusalem, don't go to Jerusalem. The Lord told him over and over again, don't go to Jerusalem. He went. But the Lord still stood by him. Hallelujah. Thank God we can make mistakes. And Jesus will still stand by us. Thank God we can make mistakes. And the Lord will still come to our rescue. Thank God we can make mistakes. And the Lord will still Amen. give us direction. Hallelujah to God. Woo, glory. He said, Paul, you've borne witness to me in Jerusalem. He said, but before this journey is over, you're going to be in Rome. You're going to be up in front of the highest authority in this government. So take, take heart. You ain't going to die in Jerusalem. Because if you were going to die in Jerusalem, you'd never make it to Rome. So obviously the Lord telling him, you're going to live. You're going to be alive a while. Don't worry about it. You'll bear witness also of me in, at Rome. Verses 12 through 35. This is the end of the chapter. I told you we could do three chapters. When it was day, certain of the Jews banded together and bound themselves under a curse, saying that they would neither eat nor drink Till they had killed Paul. Boy, isn't that a spiritual mindset? Isn't that a holy spiritual mindset? And they were more than 40 which had made this conspiracy. And they came to the chief priests and elders and said, We have bound ourselves under a great curse that we will eat nothing until we have slain Paul. Oh, we got some folk going to lose some weight. Because <laughs> Paul's headed to Rome, honey, so you're in trouble. Now, therefore, ye with the council signify to the chief captain that he bring him down unto you tomorrow, as though ye would inquire something more perfectly concerning him. And we, or ever he come near, are ready to kill him. And when Paul's sister's son, heard of their lying in wait. What would that make him? Yeah. Paul's nephew. When Paul's nephew heard of their lying in wait, he went and entered into the castle and told Paul. So he went to the jail, visited Paul, told him. Then Paul called one of the centurions unto him and said, Bring this young man unto the chief captain, for he hath a certain thing to tell him. So he took him and brought him to the chief captain and said, 
Paul the prisoner called me unto him and prayed me to bring this young man unto thee who hath something to say unto thee. Then the chief captain took him by the hand and went with him aside privately and asked him, What is it that thou hast to tell me? And he said, The Jews have agreed to desire thee that thou wouldest bring down Paul tomorrow into the council as though they would inquire somewhat of him more perfectly. But do not thou yield unto them for their lie, for their lie in wait for him of them more than forty men which have bound themselves with an oath that they will neither eat nor drink till they have killed him. And now are they ready looking for the, a promise from thee. So the chief captain then let the young man depart and charged him. See thou tell no man that thou hast showed these things to me. And he called unto him two centurions, saying, Make ready two hundred soldiers to go to Sisera, and horsemen three score and ten, and spearmen two hundred at the third hour of the night, and provide them beasts that they may set Paul on, and bring him safe unto Felix the governor. <laughs> Woo! He surrounded Paul with an army. <laughs> he put an army around that boy. Hundreds of men. Said they got 40? Well, I'll just beat that by about 10 times. Our Lord have mercy. And he wrote a letter after this manner. Claudius Lysias unto the most excellent governor Felix sendeth greeting. This man was taken of the Jews and should have been killed of them. Then came I with an army and rescued him, having understood that he was a Roman. <laughs> Liar. He didn't know Paul was a Roman. That's not why he went initially and grabbed Paul out of the midst of that bunch of rioting Jews. But see, he, he tried to paint the picture a little different. He was a Roman, so I, of course, went in immediately to risk him. Yeah, right, okay. And when I would have known the cause wherefore they accused him, I brought him forth into their council, whom I perceived to be accused of questions of their law but to have nothing laid to his charge worthy of death or bonds. And when it was told me how that the Jews laid wait for the man, I sent straightway to thee and gave commandment to his accusers also to say before thee what they had against him. Farewell. So he's passing the buck. He's going to the higher authority. He's passing Paul on. He says, I, I passed him on to you. And I'm telling these fools down here that now, listen, you want to continue this fight you got with this man, Paul? You need to go up to Felix's house and talk with him there, because I've sent him on. And when it was, uh, let me see. Then the soldiers, as it was commanded them, took Paul and brought him by night to Antip uh, Antipatris. On the morrow they left the horsemen to go with him and return to the castle, who, when they came to Sisera and de delivered the epistle to the governor, presented Paul also before him. And when the governor had read the letter, he asked of what province he was, and when he understood that he was of Cilicia, I will hear thee, said he, when thine accusers are also come. And he commanded him to be kept in Herod's judgment hall. So Felix asked him, what makes you a Roman citizen? What part of Italy are you from that you would be a Roman citizen? Paul tells him, Cilicia. He says, oh, okay, all right, well then I'll hear you. He said, but we've got to wait till your accusers get here before I'll pursue this matter any further. And that's the end of chapter 23.